Welcome to our next Wondering Walks and Wonder adventure. Today we're headed to the 18th and Vine Historic District in Kansas City, Missouri. This walking tour will showcase the African American history of Kansas City. This walk includes tours in, in, around monuments, museums, landmarks in this beautiful historic jazz district that's centered around the 18th and Vine area in Kansas City. We'll see landmarks like the Gem Theater and the American Jazz Museum that preserve and celebrate the city's contribution to the most uniquely American art form of jazz. Our tour begins here in front of the Black Archives of Mad America, which includes several exhibits related to the history and, and accomplishments of people who have lived and worked in this historic neighborhood. The 18th and Vine District played a pivotal role in the development of jazz music during the early 20th century. Legendary jazz musicians such as Char Charlie Parker and Count Basie have roots in this area. The district was once a hub for jazz clubs, theaters, and live music venues. The district is also famous for its connection to the Negro Leagues Baseball, which was the premier baseball league for African American players before Major League Baseball integrated. We'll walk past and take a look at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum also on this tour. The district has been a center of African American cultural life in Kansas City for decades and decades and decades. It is, was, and is, still is a vibrant community with thriving businesses, social clubs, churches, and much more serving as a hub for African American residents. Over the years, the district faced economic challenges and declined in significance. However, over the past decade or so, there have been many efforts, and most of those successful, to revitalize and preserve the area's cultural heritage. On top of restoration of buildings and new museums, the Urban Youth Academy is also an area where revitalization of this neighborhood has taken place. The Urban Youth Academy is a baseball and softball development facility and program that's designed to provide younger athletes, particularly those from underserved communities, with access to coaching, training, and educational opportunities related to the sport of baseball and softball. This academy includes state-of-the-art indoor and outdoor facilities, including baseball fields, softball fields, batting cages, pitching mounds, training areas, and more. Professional coaches and instructors work with young athletes to improve their baseball and softball skills. The academy also emphasizes the importance of education alongside, alongside athletics. In the heart of the 18th and Vine District, the Greg Kleiss Community Center has provided recreational options to the housing communities that has surrounded this area since 1955 when it was originally named the Gregg Center. In 1996, that building was torn down and the current Gregg Kleiss Community Center was built to honor the, the legacy of activists John H. Gregg and Arrington Bubble Kleiss. We're heading towards a memorial to Charlie Parker. Charles Christopher Parker Jr. was born in 1920 in Kansas City, Kansas. At the age of seven, his family moved to Kansas City, Missouri. Parker learned to play the saxophone at an early age, and, w and when he was 15, he dropped out of high school to pursue a music career. For the next several years, he played jazz music at various nightclubs in Kansas City's Vine District. 
Kansas City was one of the major epicenters of jazz in the 1930s and 1940s, which had a strong influence on Parker's musical development. Parker went on to pursue a musical career in New York and California and is widely considered to be one of the creators of bebop. This statue features Parker's head tilted downward, eyes shut, and lips pursed as if he was playing the saxophone. At the base of the statue is an inscription that reads, Bird Lives, a reference to Parker's nickname and his long-lasting legacy. Parker received the nickname Bird or Yardbird. One of the reasons for this nickname vary, but one explanation was that Parker was considered by friends to be free as a bird. Another is that he accidentally hit a chicken while driving one time. Morning. This large neon sign here at the intersection of 18th and Vine is a celebration of the rich musical and cultural heritage of the city's African-American musicians and artists, as well as the vibrant African-American community that developed in spite of systematic racism and entrenched institutional segregation in this area. The concentration of theaters, clubs, cabarets, and other venues drew a veritable who's who of jazz of the jazz world in the 1930s and 1940s. From Jesse Stone to George E. Lee to Mary Lou Williams, this was a hotbed of jazz in the early 1930s and 40s. Completed in 1914, the Paseo YMCA building was and is a major landmark of the black community in Kansas City. Hosting a multitude of clubs, leagues, and activities, the YMCA provided the community with amenities that were otherwise denied due to segregation. This building was also the site of the creation of the Negro League Baseball of the, of the Negro National Baseball League in 1920. Led by Rube Foster, the league became the first long-term and commercially viable association of baseball teams in the area of segregation. Unfortunately, declining attendance in the 1960s and 1970s forced the YMCA to close, though the rebuilding itself remained. Since the early 2000s, the building has been restored and has been closely tied to efforts by the neighboring Negro League Baseball Museum to utilize the building as a research center dedicated to not only the Negro Leagues, but also named in honor of Hall of Famer Buck O'Neill. Speaking of Buck O'Neill, this park is in tribute to him. Buck O'Neill, whose full name was John Jordan O'Neill Jr., was a legendary figure in the world of baseball, particularly in the context of the Negro Leagues. He was a player, coach, manager, and ambassador for the game. He's known for his contributions to American baseball and his tireless efforts to preserve the history and legacy of the, Na of the Negro Leagues. Buck O'Neill played as a first baseman and manager for the Kansas City Monarchs, one of the most prominent teams in the Negro Leagues. He was known for his leadership on and off the field and was a well-respected figure among his peers. After his playing career, Buck O'Neill became a dedicated historian and advocate for the Negro Leagues. He worked tirelessly to ensure that the stories and achievements of Negro League players were not forgotten. He played a pivotal role in the establishment of the Negro League's baseball museum, which we'll walk by here in just a bit. He served as the museum's chairman and was instrumental in raising awareness and funding for the museum, 
which celebrates the history and impact of African-American baseball. Buck O'Neill was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1922. Constructed in 1923, the Roberts Building was initially owned by realtor John T. Sears. Soon after construction was completed, entrepreneur Homer B. Roberts purchased the building from Sears for around $70,000. In the building, Roberts established a highly successful car dealership, as well as housing Good. several How other black-owned businesses and providing jobs to African-American people in the area. Another historic building here on Vine Street is the Eblon Theater. The Eblon Theater was Kansas City's first African-American owned and operated theater. The club was constructed in 1922 with the Spanish colonial facade and had seating for up to a thousand patrons. The theater opened in 1923 as a venue for vaudeville and motion pictures. In 1933 the Eblon Theater closed and the Cherry Blossom opened in its place. The Cherry Blossom Club, located here inside the Eblon Theater, was one of Kansas City's most popular destinations for jazz. The club was also where many influential jazz musicians made a name for themselves, including the great Count Basie and Benny Moulton. We're now walking past the Lincoln Building. Constructed in 1921, this building was home to numerous African-American professionals as well as retail and entertainment spaces throughout the 20th century. The building's name is a reference to the Lincoln Furniture Company, which originally occupied much of the first floor along the Lincoln Dance Hall, which was located on the third floor and hosted many of the nation's leading jazz bands. 
In the decades that followed, the building housed the office of the Kansas City Monarchs, along with other black-owned businesses, which included many dentists, attorneys, and other professionals. The building was renovated in the late 1970s and now serves as home to several community and civil rights organizations, as well as restaurant and retail space. A modern landmark within the historic 18th and Vine District, the Blue Room Jazz Club is connected to the American Jazz Museum and showcases some of the most significant jazz musicians. A museum by day and hopping jazz club at night, the Blue Room blends music and entertainment with history and is a favorite for residents of the Kansas City metro area. To our left is the American Jazz Museum and the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. The American Jazz Museum celebrates the cultural, historical, and artistic contributions that occurred here at the 18th and Vine Historic District. It showcases the cultural and musical explosion that hit Kansas City in the 1920s and 30s. Additionally, the American Jazz Museum is the only museum in the world solely focused on the preservation, exhibition, and advancement of jazz music. Located within the same building complex is the Negro Leagues Baseball Ball Museum. This museum preserves and shares the history of African Americans in baseball from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement, when MLB teams and Southern Minor League teams began to hire black players, coaches, and front office personnel. Inside is a replica of Kansas City's Millbuck Stadium with statues of the game's greatest players. Make sure to take a look at the playlist that I have and you can see a full tour of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. Built in 1912, the Gym Theater, originally named the Star Theater, served Kansas City's African American population as a silent movie palace. It was renamed the Gym Theater in 1913 and soon became an established fixture here in the 18th and Vine District. Eventually, the theater switched from movies to live performances before following, falling into disrepair in the 1960s. However, unlike many other architectural landmarks in the 18th and Vine Jazz Age area, the Gym Theater escaped the raising that took place in the 70s and 80s of buildings as part of urban development projects. In the 1990s, the theater was renovated in a process that removed much of the original interior to make space for a modern performance venue.
Ahead of us is the historic Boone Theater. Constructed in 1924, the building was originally named the New Rialto. The theater was renamed the Boone Theater in 1929 after the famous Black Child Piano Progeny from Missouri, John W. Blind Boone. In 1949, the building was remodeled and opened as Scott's Theater Bar. Only a few years later, the restaurant closed and its day as an entertainment venue was over. In the mid-1960s, the building was used as a meeting place for local veterans. Unfortunately, the building has been in somewhat disrepair, but there are plans to renovate it as part of the overall 18th and Vine Historic District renovation efforts that are continuing to go on. We're walking past the Kansas City Call building. The Call is a prominent Afri African American weekly newspaper that was founded in Kansas City, Missouri in 1919 by Chester A. Franklin. Franklin took his newspaper from a small four-page weekly to one of the leading African American weeklies in the nation, covering a mix of local and national events and playing an instrumental role in pushing for civil rights campaigns in Kansas City. One of the call's leading journal journalists, Roy Wilkins, would go on to become the executive secretary of the NAACP, a position he would hold until 1977. The call is published every Friday to this day. Undergoing an extensive renovation area is the Attic School. This building was constructed in 1905 and expanded in 1922. The school was named for Crispus Attic's, a formerly enslaved man who was killed in the Boston Massacre in, in 1770. This building is once served as a chief educational facility here in the 18th and Vine District. It was closed uh, in the 1960s and remained empty, but is now being repurposed as an art studio gallery and event space that will bring to life, new life, to the century-old fixture in the area.
1917, 25 African American musicians joined together to form the Musicians Protective Union Local Number 627 inside this building that we see here. The support offered by the new union enabled many of them to turn their music into full-time careers by helping secure fair contracts and working conditions and allowing them to put roots in the Kansas City area instead of working as itinerant musicians. In 1929, the union was officially incorporated and purchased an apartment building here on Highland Avenue, which the union converted into its headquarters. Next door to the union building is the Rochester Hotel. This building was built in 1919 to about 1930. It was one of the only hotels where visiting Afri African Americans could find accommodations during the 1930s and 1940s in Kansas City. Because of its adjacency to the Mutual Musicians Foundation, this is the place where jazz artists such as Count Basie, Jimmy Rushing, and many others would have stayed during visits to the city. The hotel also provided accommodations for visiting teams for the Negro Leagues before becoming for the Negro Leagues. Before becoming a hotel, the building was a 24-unit apartment complex serving a working-class clientele. I hope you've enjoyed this Wondering Walks of Wonder tour here through the 18th and Vine District. Make sure to hit that like and subscribe button and we will see you on our next Wondering Walks of Wonder adventure. Take care now. Bye-bye.